main event, I'd like to introduce Nancy Jacobson. We're pleased to have her come all the way down from Ithaca area. She's a retired biology teacher from Ithaca College and uh, also was here once before with this climate, or this citizen's climate lobby. It's right there. Okay, and uh, she's still involved with that. And uh, she's going to tell us about fossil fuels. And you're going to have to work on nuclear too now, right? <laughs> well. <laughs> how, how either good or bad that is for us. But uh, anyways, welcome Nancy. And Thank you. I'm going to turn the light off in the front. And uh, that should make it uh, better. Is that good? One more? Is that better? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, Alan asked me, would you do some uh, a presentation on health impacts from fossil fuels? And I went, okay. <laughs> I'm not an expert, but I'll give it a whirl. So I know that some of you will know more about some of these things than I do. And so if you want to, say, flesh it out, go for it. Um, but I will try to at least give an overview. Um, this is such a broad topic, you know, one could go on for hours. Um, so first of all, you know, for me especially, I'm part of the Citizens Climate Lobby, and so I view fossil fuels as the cause of climate change. But um, <clears throat> human health is an issue that can reach a lot of people who don't even, you know, who just don't want to think about climate change. And so this is a good way of getting um, more people involved with thinking about how to move away from fossil fuels. So I'm going to talk about the impact uh, the health impacts of fossil fuels uh, through water pollution, through air pollution, um, and a little bit, tiny bit about working to end fossil fuels, and then thinking a little bit more broadly um, about both, you know, globally the impacts, um, or at least where uh, it's having the greatest impact, uh, and also um, globally in extending past just um, the health effects of fossil fuels to include a little bit about climate change, okay? So, first of all, um, what are the impacts from fossil fuels mediated by water pollution? Well, first of all, fossil fuels are in the ground, right? And that's where there are a lot of heavy metals. Um, I'm not going to talk about the, the nuclei, um, radionuclides, but there are some of those in there too. And when you bring up fossil fuels, you bring up those. And in fact, heavy metals are actually found in coal. So they're digging up from deep in the ground there, or just blasting to get down to it, right? Um, and exposing all of that to erosion. And then, of course, there's fracking for both oil and natural gas. That involves putting a lot of water plus chemicals um, into deep into the ground. Um, and then bringing it back up with all those toxins in it, right? So, what do they do with this? Well, um, first of all, coal has to be cleaned. It's got dirt and all of that stuff, so it's sort of crushed a little and cleaned, and that water then, they have to do something with. You know, there's chemicals in there that help clean it, and they've got some heavy metals from the coal. So a lot of times they just, at the, the head of a, a valley, 
just put an impoundment there, you know. So, um, so it's just sitting there, toxic brew. <coughs> Same with wastewater pools from fracking. Um, and then some fracking fluid, um, it, wastewater, is put down wells um, and it can migrate from there. So, you know, that's the problem, you know, that's exactly what you were talking about, how, you know, these things that you're bringing up, they're going to be around for a while, a long while. And we just don't even know how to deal with them. So they contain heavy metals, the chemicals that were used in the fracking fluid to do the deed, um, and chemicals used in washing coal. And all of these, they're, you know, some are more toxic than others, um, but they're all in the environment now, right? So, um, not only that, but every year, over a hundred million tons of coal ash is produced. That's produced when you burn the coal, you have all this stuff left. First of all, there's the stuff that's lighting up that would just fly out that um, stack if you didn't capture it. So fortunately, they capture it, but then they have to do something with it, right? And there's the heavier stuff that falls to the bottom. And, you know, there's also, you know, fortunately there's pollution, you know, like for um, sulfur dioxide. You know, they, that was great that they were able to capture that before it went out the stack. But then they have to do something with that, right? So all of that stuff has to be put somewhere. And it's basically, there's so much fly ash, that's the light stuff, that you can't just make a pile outside or else it would all blow away with all those wonderful heavy metals, right? So they either put it in a landfill or they mix it with water and put it into a big pond or whatever. So here's one such set of ponds. Now one thing about coal plants is they are almost always next to water, right? Because they need it for cooling. <coughs> well, if they're next to water, and, and actually that allows them to mix the fly ash with water and put them in ponds, but then things can happen, right? And you can have this overflowing or whatever into the river or the lake or wherever they are. And that's how it can get, one of the ways it can get into the water. Now, some of it, some of the, the ash is actually used to make concrete and the people who are near these things go, yay! So um, it's getting some of it out. Um, the idea is that you actually encapsulate all of that, and so it's not going to fly away or anything. Um, and so that's probably pretty good, and it replaces the cement, and we all know how bad cement is, you know, it's, it's very energy intensive. It also creates a lot more CO2 just by um, being made. And so that's not a bad thing. Um, I haven't heard anything bad about the, the concrete, but I have heard bad things about using it for structural fill. So sometimes it's used, you know, where they just need to put something in so that they can build on it. And it has gotten into groundwater that way. So that probably is not such a good idea. But 
there aren't very many good ideas for this. Hmm. So those heavy metals and the added ones can be get into the water through leaching. So that's what would happen with the, the surface fill. Um, you know, water would get in there and then percolate down and take those heavy metals with it into the groundwater. Um, now this is an example of water that's gone through um, either an abandoned, well, it says an abandoned coal mine. I'm not sure whether it's an underground mine. I think it's a surface mine. And I mean, think of all the water that can go across a surface mine when you've <coughs> taken off a whole mountaintop, right? And so this is very acidic, plus it has those heavy metals. Um, also, um, even a landfill. Um, so coal ash being put into a landfill. They've done that in um, Niagara, uh, the coal power plant there. You know, very conscientiously put it into a landfill. And then they've had to monitor groundwater since 2015 now. That's one of the rules that the Obama administration made in the EPA was that you at least have to monitor <coughs> the groundwater and see if there's something going on. And they found that there was, and they had to close down the landfill. Um, now, what was interesting about that rule, though, um, a judge said, hey, guys, you know, this really isn't adequate. It's saying that all coal ash ponds that are made from now on have to be lined, but not old ones. And you don't, and you're not closing down old unlined coal ash ponds. Um, but that's how it stayed. And now, of course, it's being weakened even further. Yeah. You know, but uh, Sierra Club has been deeply involved in Beyond Coal. Yeah. And quite successful in closing coal-fired power plants, but just occurs to me that that means that those ponds are basically abandoned. So yeah. if they had had some responsibility for maintaining them before, they can say, hey, well, I think we in sold that, that. I think in that ruling it does say that they have to keep monitoring it for, but I think it's like 30 years. You know, so... But yeah. And if the, if the company's out of business. Yeah. Yeah. They so, shrug. Right? You know, that's one of those externalities that's placed on all of us, right? Yeah. So, spills of fracking fluid. You know, thousands and thousands of cases where it's been shown that either the fracking fluid itself, you know, with chemicals, um, and about a hundred of the chemicals that are used out of about a thousand of the chemicals, not all of them are used in each month, in each well, but about a hundred of them are endocrine disruptors. So they interfere with reproduction and with development. Um, and so, you know, just Spilling the fracking fluid itself is bad. We, you don't want those in the water, either groundwater or sur surface water. Um, but then even worse is if they spill the wastewater, which has that and the heavy metals, etc. So then there are the spills when impoundments fail. So I showed you, you know, the washing of the coal, you've got impoundments, but then you also have it for, at the power plants for the coal ash, right? And here is the largest failure that's ever happened. This was um, TVA Kingston plant. Um, <laughs> I mean, one reason is that ash 
has been disposed there since 1958. So that's a lot of ash. Um, over one billion gallons of fly ash slurry escaped from the retention pond. So this was just a failure in the earthen dam that was holding it. Um, and you can see, this is the original fly ash pond. It spread out all here and into Emory River. And also another river that you can't see here, the Clinch River. Um, and they were finding heavy metals you know, for quite a ways down after that. So, as happens, right? And then, of course, uh, a more recent one was when a hurricane came through, you know, and dumped huge amounts of rain <coughs> and whipped up water. And, of course, you know, <laughs> that can overflow a retention pond, right? Uh, so um, there are lots of ways to get that awful stuff into our water uh, where we drink it. So. If you've got it in the groundwater, then if you're using a well from that groundwater and it's, it's from near enough by that it's in there, that's going to be chronic. You know, as, as you said, it lasts. You know, the heavy metal is, is in there. And so that is, even if it's low level, it's chronic. It's going to be um, continuing to build up in your body. Now, if it's in surface water, then that means there's a lot of living things in there, right? And this one is showing mercury, but I think just about any heavy metal will bioaccumulate. And so, um, in the case of mercury, uh, it gets changed from inorganic mercury into methyl mercury, which is an organic form. Um, and that's done by bacteria. And so then those little things that eat bacteria eat them. And they eat a lot of bacteria, so they build up. And then those things get eaten by things like krill, little, you know, <coughs> arthropods. And then, but they eat a lot, and so it builds up in them. And then the little fish eat the krill, builds up, and builds up, and builds up. Until you've got um, more and more mercury in the fish. And so, if you've uh, seen mercury warnings, you know, they're classified. You know, usually these. So here they're saying you can eat as many of these salmon, pollock, or oysters as you want because um, you're not going to build it up to the point that, um, I mean, you're not going to eat that much. Here, you can only eat a few times per week. Here, only a few times per month. And especially pregnant women have to um, cut out fish that are contaminated at all. Mm. So, um, so that's what bioaccumulation is. And so consequently, um, you know, that's a way for water pollution to then end up um, in food, right? And we get the contamination through eating food. So, Arsenic, mercury, and lead are the most common, but there's a whole range. You know, it depends on where the coal is, you know, what geological formation there is. There's also selenium, cadmium, chromium, beryllium, da 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 da. These are the three most common ones. These are found in most of them. Um, and all of these are linked to problems with the development of the nervous system. So, um, you know, it's, everyone's familiar with lead 
poisoning and you know how you know there are children who just don't do so well in school because they've got some lead in their their brains and it it inhibited the develop proper development um, so all of these things happen there now arsenic also is linked with several types of cancer so um, and and some of these others are as well so um, there's a whole range of of health impacts you know but it gets pretty boring to say gastrointestinal problems and anemia and you know on and on and on and on it's like okay I get the picture so I tried to simplify it okay so that's water pollution um, and that's the one we probably think of less and yet I mean that's there you know to be a problem for a very long time. Um, air pollution is what we usually think of when we think of pollution caused by fossil fuels. Now, we usually don't think of black lung though, right? But that's, you know, um, a problem from breathing the poor miners, right? And what's amazing is that it is still a problem. This has been known for how long? It's caused by silica dust, you know, while they're down there in the mine. And the thing is, is that NIOSH, which is, uh, oh, I've got it up there. Anyways, you know, basically, um, the miners have said, I don't want to be tested. They, you know, part of it is, you know, you're not going to tell me what to do. But another is that they're afraid of losing their job, right, if they're found to have it. Um, and so they'd rather just not know so that they can still bring in a paycheck. Well, what that's done is the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health found during like an eight-year period 115 cases of advanced black lung. Frontline and NPR decided to do an investigation and they contacted health clinics across Appalachia. And so for that same period of time, 2010 to 2018, they found more than 2,300 cases. So because people were afraid to get tested, they didn't even know that they were getting, you know, the simple one. And so they've got the progressive, the complex one. So this is still an issue, it's pretty sad. Okay, now the kind that we're think, we think of more is from automobiles, trucks, um, coal fire power plants, etc. And the main ones there are particulate matter and ozone, ground level ozone. And what's amazing is about four in 10 US citizens live in counties where levels of these pollutants are above safe levels. It's according to the American Lung Association. <coughs> so that's pretty amazing. Now, I just I know that my students have always been confused by ground level versus the good ozone. <laughs> Why is some ozone good and some ozone is bad? Well, the ozone that's up in the stratosphere, you know, making, you know, intercepting the UV light, the 
the UVB and UVC, the very high energy and very damaging ultraviolet light. Um, so that keeps though you know the really uh, high energy UV light from reaching the surface. So so that's why it's good ozone. It's still O3. It's O3 if it's up there, it's O3 down here. But it's the pollution, um, pollutants that form the ozone down here at the surface level. So cars and, and power plants and stuff don't emit ozone. What they emit is NOx, so that's either nitric oxide, NO, or nitrogen dioxide, NO2. Those interact with oxygen, O2, in the presence of VOC, volatile organic compounds, and actually methane is one, um, you know, but then also gasoline, evaporated gasoline is a um, VOC, um, but that acts as a catalyst to um, make sure that, well, that it doesn't cycle around and around, that O3 stays. Okay, so you've got cars, power plants, and as Vera was saying, also um, so at fracking sites, you get this too. Now, <coughs> what are the impacts on health? Well, it's a, an irritant. It actually destroys cells that line your airway, your trachea, and your lungs. Um, and it exacerbates asthma, especially in children. Uh, it also exacerbates emphysema and bronchitis. It also increases risk in children of pneumonia and upper respiratory infections. All of these things are not very surprising, right? You breathe them in, it's in your lungs, and it does damage. But it also increases the risk of heart attacks, and premature death. So this is not such good stuff. Um, these are the main uh, sources of particulate matter. Now, I had never realized that particulate matter was really just an umbrella for a lot of things. And maybe two of the more important ones are soot, also known as black carbon, um, and sulfate aerosols. So sulfate aerosols form from sulfur dioxide in the atmosphere, you get this making of a, you know, an actual entity that's made up of more than one thing. Um, now, sulfate aerosols, as far as climate change, are actually kind of good because they reflect the sunlight and cool the planet. But health-wise, no, <laughs> they're not good. Um, and they come from power plants from, from you know mountaintop removal. You know, think of exposed coal, right? And how wind can erode that and carry it away. And they've found, you know, very high particulate matter levels uh, around mountaintop removal sites. Right. So the people around there are just really getting you know, one way or another, you know, they take it off, they dump it in the valleys, they completely destroy the hydrology of the system, and then on top of that, particulate matter in the air. Isn't that wonderful? And then, you know, we all remember these. They've gotten better. There are now filters, um, so trucks don't have to belch the black smoke. 
um, but now some still do. The size actually does matter um, because large particles, yeah, they may get in to your lungs, but it, the smaller the size, the more they can get deep into your lungs, they can avoid your body's defenses, and they can actually get into the blood. They can pass through those cell walls, and well, cell walls, cell membranes, and go from the lungs into the blood. And so then they can go all over the place. Right? And this is kind of nice. If you just look at one, one, just look at one of your hairs, and think that that's that size compared to, these are the two that are usually measured PM10, so less than 10 micrometers wide, and here's PM2.5, so less than 2.5 micrometers wide. So these are small. And, you know, different size has different impacts. Um, the smallest ones, not surprisingly, can cause cardiovascular disease, um, heart attacks, stroke, things like that, because they've gotten into your blood, right? Now, I found this kind of interesting, that they've actually found um, effects of particulate matter in terms of preterm births. So they've calculated that 3% of all preterm births in the U.S. were caused by particulate matter increases. Um, stillbirths, exposure to that really tiny one, PM 2.5, um, you know, above what's considered safe, right? increased stillbirths by 42%. I mean, the number of stillbirths aren't huge, but this has bumped it up. And then cognitive decline in age, and I can relate to this. Uh, so exposure to really fine particulate matter increased the risk for dementia by 92%. Ay, yay, yay. I'm having a hard enough time and I don't think I have to worry about this. So that's not good. So this is kind of a nice overall and it's showing that actually ozone pollution and particle pollution do a lot of the same things. You know, they can cause premature death, they can cause developmental harm, reproductive harm, asthma attacks, wheezing and coughing, cardiovascular harm, susceptibility to infections, etc. The only one that there's a difference is lung cancer. So the particulates can actually um, exacerbate, trigger, I don't know what you want to call it, lung cancer, whereas ozone, apparently not. There's a lot of stuff here. Okay, so, I mean, we want to get rid of these things, right? So, first of all, you know, we look around and yes, we, we all want to get rid of it. But there are some people who want to get rid of it even more because they are more affected. So African Americans face the highest impact of the groups they looked at um, from particulate emissions from coal fueled power plants. Um, they have a 54% higher health burden compared to the overall population. Um, so what I found very interesting. This guy, Mustafa Ali, has been at the EPA for, I think I remember, maybe eight years now, um, looking at environmental justice. He's actually, that's been his job, right? And 
he is now resigning because his funding has been cut. Uh, no surprise there, right? Um, another, um, I find this, this is the group uh, that's doing a lot of stuff, anti-fracking, anti-XL uh, pipeline, anti-coal fire, fire power plants. Um, uh, the executive director of this group, Indigenous Environmental Network, says to our indigenous people, this is a life and death issue. And that's because they eat a lot of fish, right? And so if all those heavy metals are bioaccumulating in fish, then that makes it very dangerous to have a really fish heavy diet. So, so they are working towards that. And I know that a number of work groups has worked with Sierra Club with their Beyond Coal. So um, coal is the dirtiest energy source because of all those sources of contamination, right? Yeah. With the, uh, the, the uh, black people having a more impact from particulates, is that because of residential patterns? Or yeah, other yeah. So basically, the siting of the coal-fired power plants is more likely to be in a uh, community of color. Right. Yeah. So, yep. And you guys probably know this more than I, even better than I do, you know, what the goals are here retire half the nation's coal plants, replace the retired coal plants with energy efficiency and clean energy, and keep coal in the ground, right? You know, so that it isn't exported and burned overseas. So even if we move away from it, you know, if we just export it, then that's not really helping. And this is on the Sierra Club website, and I found this very interesting. So you can see all those gray dots are where the coal plants have either already been retired or will be retired by 2030. <coughs> and what's really nice is, is if you look at New York, they're all gray. No orange or, or yellow ones. Okay? So, um, they're all retired or will be retired by 2030. So, so think about things a little more globally. So here's urban air pollution worldwide. And, you know, the Clean Air Act has done good, right? <laughs> Ours is so much lower than places in like China and India. Um, I heard a speaker uh, at Cornell the other day. He's been looking at health impacts globally. And he said, um, people in Delhi, India, um, the air that they breathe is basically equivalent to smoking five cigarettes a day. And on really, really bad days in Delhi, it's like smoking 44 cigarettes in a day. So, I mean, here we have a place in China, right, where they're all wearing their masks. Um, but that actually maybe gives us hope <laughs> because the health impacts can be decreased quickly. Right? Now, for those of us who want to move us away because of climate change, that's a harder sell because, you know, even if we completely stopped emitting CO2 and other greenhouse gases today, we had a magic wand, Woo! we did it, the temperature would still go up. Um, 20 to the end of the century and beyond would increase, I've heard, 
0.3 degrees Celsius from one, 0.5 degrees from another. But, I mean, we've only gone up one degree so far since the Industrial Re Revolution started. And that's because of the energy balance. More energy is coming into the Earth system from the sun than is leaving the, the Earth system because it's being trapped by greenhouse gases. And so the temperature just keeps going up until the amount, you know, the percentage that usually can leave, you know, once you've got, you're not increasing the greenhouse gas blanket anymore. Once you've got that percentage, you've got it high enough, then enough is leaving to balance what's coming in, and then temperature will stabilize. But in the case of health impacts, I mean, in Los Angeles, a 10 mile stretch of major freeway closed for like 36 hours, I think. Because they were doing repairs. In minutes, ultrafine particulates decreased by 83%, and PM 2.5 um, decreased by 36% during those 36 hours. So, this, you know, if you want to get rid of that pollution, get rid of fossil fuels and you will see it happen, right? Unless you're talking about the water pollution. But, but, um, but this, is, this is good, because this can, can really sell, sell people on making change, right? Um, and of course, you know, the elephant in the room are all the health impacts from climate change caused by the burning of fossil fuels, right? Which, they're a huge number. Um, and it exacerbates um, those caused by uh, air pollution, because something like ozone is, uh, you get more ozone forming from the NOx in the box uh, when you've got warmer temperatures. Um, you can see that between the um, summer and the winter. You get a lot more ozone forming in the summer than in the winter. But just think of all those increased heat waves. More frequent, more, you know, longer, more intense. That's going to make the ozone even worse, right? Um, but then there are lots of other. Okay, so, I'm from Citizens Climate Lobby, and I can't do a presentation without talking about our bill. <laughs> so, last time we were here, we talked about a carbon fee and dividend. Well, now, it's a bill that has been introduced into Congress. So, Ted Deutsch is the the main sponsor, and actually um, they did it last session in November, so at the very end, obviously it wasn't going to go anywhere, but they wanted to show that even in a Republican-dominated, you know, House, they could have a bipartisan bill. And so within the first week of introducing it, they had three Republicans, three Democrats. Um, it was also introduced in the Senate in December. That was because Jeff Flake went to Jim Coons and said, we've got to introduce this bill before I leave Congress. So, <laughs> so they did. Jeff Coons is, is now looking for another Republican in the Senate to co-sponsor with. But we're hopeful that it will be in June. Um, and so, it's basically a fee and dividend, so fee is, is placed on uh, fossil fuels, so at the coal, coal mine mouth, uh, at the refinery, at the, um, 
natural gas processing plant. Um, so it's, it's bottlenecks. Um, and then the revenue from that, so that will make fossil fuels more expensive, right? And that price will be passed on, right? Until it finally reaches the consumer. So a carbon tax by itself is regressive. It hurts the poor more than the rich. And so what, what this does, by giving a carbon dividend to every single person in it, every adult gets a full share, every child gets a half share. That means that those with lower carbon footprints, which are the low income people, actually come out ahead with that flat dividend. Whereas those who are richer um, <coughs> don't. But they can make changes and lower their carbon footprint. They could come out ahead if they want. And they have the money that they could do things, you know, like having a, you know, solar, etc. And then there's a carbon border adjustment so that businesses can stay competitive and don't get businesses leaving because of the carbon tax. So, so basically, um, if goods are being imported from a country that does not have a carbon tax, they would be at an advantage, right? Well, at the border, you up the price. You put a, a tariff on there um, to make it equivalent to what it would be if they had an equivalent carbon price in that country. And what that does is it keeps things, com keeps our companies competitive, but it also incentivizes those other countries to place a price on theirs so that they get to keep the money, right? Instead of us getting the money. And so it's effective. Um, Modeling showed a 40% decrease in 12 years. And given that the IPCC says 50% in 12 years, that does a lot of the heavy lifting. You know, we need other things as well, but this does a lot, right? Um, and it protects the uh, low and middle class, middle income people from those uh, rising energy costs. Uh, and it actually creates jobs. Because when people who have very low income, have low income, um, actually come out ahead, they're going to spend that money. And they're most likely to spend that money on things like health care, daycare stuff like that. And those jobs, that those are things that are very labor intensive. We need to have a lot of people. Yeah. I, I would say that this also encourages uh, localism. Mm -hmm. Because the further you transport something, yeah. the more energy you burn and the more carbon tax you pay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Could you specify, I wasn't clear what this is effective on lowering the... Okay, so the whole reason is that, so they passed the, the increased cost on, right? So anything that's made using energy that's made with fossil fuels, it's okay. gonna be more expensive. Right? Anything that's made with energy using fossil fuels. It's gonna be more expensive. Okay. But at each of those stages, you know, if I can get my energy from renewable sources, which is not going to go up every year, and that's the key. This carbon fee goes up every year. It starts at $15 per ton of CO2, uh, which is low, but that's so that it doesn't disrupt the economy. But then it goes up $10 every single year, and so in 10 years, it's $100 per ton of CO2 over that. And so, so if you've got the option of getting it from <coughs> renewable sources, 
which are not going to increase in cost, right? Or fossil fuel <coughs> energy, which is going to get more and more and more and more expensive, then more and more will move to the renewables. Yeah. So uh, I'm just wondering how you assess this carbon fee. If, if I buy a T-shirt, mm. okay, so let's see, the cotton that it's made out of was grown using tractors that burn fossil fuels, okay, and then it was the carbon was transported using trucks. And then it was, um, the textiles were made in a factory that's powered by a coal plant. And how do you assess all those things? Because you assessed it only once back. When it was, when it was, when it was. How do you assess that? How do you, do you assess the cotton grower? Nope. Do you assess, nope. How do you assess nope. all those things for the You assess it. At the oil companies, yeah, the coal companies, yeah, and the natural gas companies. Okay, so you you assess the fossil fuels only. The fossil fuels only, not the product. Right. Oh, okay. Yep. Wasn't it all together clear? Yeah. Right. yeah. So the producer also has the incentive to move from a carbon dependent power source. Yeah. The the reason conservative people are attracted to this is because it pulls the free market into the process. Exactly. Exactly. So costs go up because your energy costs are going up if you're using those fossil fuel, fossil fuel energies. Right. Okay, so, But you get the dividend. So if you're not a profligate user of energy, then you're going to get be covered. How is the dividend being paid to people? Okay, so basically it's it's collected at the treasury, it's put into a trust fund, and every month it goes out to people. Now the last stimulus check, you remember that? That went in direct deposit to most people. It was seventeen dollars or something like that. <laughs> Wasn't it? <laughs> I, don't know. I don't remember. But um, but for most people, it would be direct deposit into their account every month. Every month. Every month. <clears throat> I don't recall getting a, a direct deposit every month. No, 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 they did. They only did one. But this would do it every month. The, once this is enacted? Yes. Oh, oh yes. I see. It's not correct. <laughs> yeah. It's not yes. enacted. If only. <laughs> I wish I had my check. <laughs> every month. Yeah, but that's okay. <laughs> So this is something we hope to get. Yes. So, so already there are 38 co-sponsors. Just looked it up. One Republic. One Republic. But that was by design by Ted Deutsch because of the whole thing about the Green New Deal. And so he didn't want it to be like, if you're a Democrat, then, well, of course you have to be for the Green New Deal, not for this. So he tried to get as many Democrats as Our possible. Our representative doesn't have to be for the Green New Deal. He says he's not for it. Yeah. Well, this is, this is just making it that much easier for, mm -hmm. for Well, and in fact, there's uh, at least one, Judy Chu, who has endorsed the Green New Deal and is a co-sponsor. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they, they wanted to make sure that Democrats mm -hmm. could feel comfortable with this. Um, we feel certain that Republicans, more Republicans, will be coming on board. This bipartisanship is incredibly important to us. We have been working with Republicans from day one. I think a lot of corporations are building something like this into their planning. Yeah, yeah. They, they, a lot they would of, rather have this than a lot of other things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So a lot of them have shadow price thing. So what would it be, would this project be um, profitable if we had a carbon tax? Um, and then some are actually doing this sort of thing within 
their companies. So that, you know, the different uh, departments are all <laughs> trying to, to get their dividend. Do they have an idea of how the, the border adjustment would be applied to different products? Yeah, so basically um, it's, it would be impossible to do it to all products. So it would be for those that are energy intensive trade exposed. And there's, there's a list. Um, at least there was a list from the cap and trade days, right? And so that gives a good idea. Um, and so obviously steel, aluminum, um, and then even fertilizer, something like that. Yeah. What about just in general shipment of goods? Would they tack a fee on at least to uh, the? the theoretical carbon used for the shipment itself from overseas? Yeah, I don't think so. Oh, too bad. Yeah, that, that starts getting so complex that, you know, you, the thing is, is that um, this pays for itself because all of the administrative costs are taken out of the fee, but we want as much as possible to be going to people, right, so that Basically, it's durable so that it lasts. People go, I don't want this to, <laughs> I don't want you to take this away from me, right? Um, but yeah, Alan, and then. I don't know if this is not exactly in the topic as far as the health impacts, but as far as when you've tried to um, promote this, what has been, you know, you've been mainly working with your own congressman, what's been the biggest obstacle to, for support? And what have you found most effective to promote it, to promote the carbon tax or some of the things? Well, you know, when we first started like five years ago with Tom Reed, mm -hmm. um, it was like, you don't really talk about climate change. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. So we talked about jobs, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and He's still not totally on board. It, it's interesting because at two public places he has said that yeah, I'm, I'm sort of warming to this fee and dividend approach, right? And yet at the House Ways and Means hearing, he stepped in line with the other Republicans there. And, and the thing is, is that the Republican line there now has shifted has shifted from being deniers mm -hmm. to now it's innovation. We need to do this through innovation. And it's like, well, that's in our name. <laughs> you know? um, but it, right now they're still doing, um, they're still talking about tax incentives, you know, production tax incentives and things like that, which Reed has been, you know, um, doing all along. So that's right in what he's comfortable with. But the fact that, you know, Kevin Brady of Texas is now in line with that, I'm like, good, <laughs> okay, we're getting somewhere. You know, and what, what was really interesting was that Kevin Brady said, are we doing as, you know, is this as much as needs to happen? No. He's not even just saying, you know, we're not deniers anymore, but this is fine, this is, this is what will work. He's saying, no, this isn't as far as we need to go, but this is as far as we can go at this time. It's like, I can work with that, <laughs> you know? So, yeah. Um, so very interesting things going on down there. Yeah, very I've gotten the impression from the initial hearings, like just in, from initially watching that maybe partially because of the maybe more activism among the youth and for mm -hmm. other reasons that, you know, as you said, the Republicans are um, less denying and they're more open to market-based approaches yeah. such as this. Yeah, which is surprising to me, you know, this whole um, 
pr tax production. Uh -huh. You know, that's re uh, just thinking, isn't this more conservative than that? <laughs> but anyways, um, so I, I think we're going to get there. I really do. So I wanted to tell you about it. And when did you say you think we would get there on this? Hmm. Well, actually, CCL National um, is saying... Um, 2021. We're going to need an election to help. Yeah, us. well, and the two things. I mean, <clears throat> yes, hopefully, but I don't think that that's going to change the Senate. I think the Senate will still be Republican. You know, so um, it's got to be bipartisan, no matter what. Um, but I think that. It's really hard to get things actually done during the election cycle. I mean, we've, we've noticed with Tom Reed, um, you know, you get one good year of talking to him and his staff um, and everything, and then you sort of take the year off that's election year. Um, and we do other things. We try to get endorsements, we give presentations, we write letters to the editor and all of that stuff. But we're not really expecting, like we had tried to organize um, a farm visit. And, you know, it turned out that then we'd have to organize it with his campaign rather than with his district office. And the <coughs> farmer wanted a Democrat as well as him. And what a mess. So. So we just try to do our, our you know, in-district stuff, um, the, the off year, and then, you know, during the election year, and then really work with him during the other year. So. Yeah. I just had a question. You mentioned that four out of ten uh, communities uh, had two, two big areas. Uh, are any of those around here at all? Not to my knowledge, um, I know a, quite a few of them are actually in California, <laughs> um, and and I think they're usually big cities with inversion. Well, I mean, oftentimes that's you know there is topographic. Um, reasons too, like Los Angeles with the mountains around it and then you get the inversion and it really makes it bad. So, yeah. Sometimes it's very local. Um, there was a report recently. In the, on the north side of Denver, there's a town called Commerce City and Commerce City actually has an oil refinery in it. You can smell it when you drive by on the highway. The poor Hispanic people, and in Colorado, those are the poorest people, are the Hispanic people, who live in Commerce City. Their children have such severe asthma that they have a special school at Jewish Children's Hospital for the children with the severe, I kid you not, wow. for the children with the severe asthma so they can have medical treatments throughout the day and still stay in school. But these poor folks have nowhere else to go and live because the rents are so high in Denver now. So yeah. this is happening lots of places, and sometimes it's very local because yeah. of industry or whatever. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, just curious, are you done with your presentation so we can keep pounding you with questions? Or? <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. All right. All right. All right. Thanks. I have a question. Uh, so, do you think that we have to try to remove Mitch McConnell? <laughs> or do you think he will come around eventually and, and start working on some of these things to combat climate change? Well, hard to say. I mean, if, if you don't know, you don't know. I, mean, I don't know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> he does come from a coal state. Yes, yes. he does. Very much so. Yeah. I mean, for, you know, for quite a while, they could... Um, 
supply all of their energy needs with the coal mined in Kentucky, right? So it was all self-contained. So, you know, and one thing about it is that um, <coughs> the meetings with our legislators are confidential. So even though I'm in CCL, I don't know what happens in meetings with Mitch McConnell with CCL members. So, um, you know, so they may be making way or they may not be. <laughs> yeah. um, I've spent some time out west. I know other people here have too. And you would think because of the vast open spaces that the air would be mm. so much better, but you know, you see the pollution out there in the air. Mm -hmm. It gets around and um, it's a combination of auto or auto truck traffic or coal plants and, and it's noticeable. Mm -hmm. you, you get up on a high vista and you look out and there's days where you will not see what you're supposed to see, you know, a, a distant mountain, for instance. Yeah. Um, yeah. I remember that was certainly true in Salt Lake City, but then you've got the mountains yeah, the surrounding them. Yeah. 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 Well, they're, they're talking about Colorado. Um, I grew up in Colorado, and it used, I remember when I was a child, it was always a clear view, 20 miles where we live, 20 miles from there to the mountains, always clear. And then over time, it's never clear. Part of it is that for many years, and I think they finally adjusted it, there were adjustments that needed to be made to autom automobile exhaust or something because of the high altitude, uh -huh. and they, wouldn't, they weren't allowed to adjust it, so they got more that way. But part of it is just you have a lot of city and the way the winds are, it comes up against the mountains. Mm -hmm. An awful lot of people live there and, and there is an awful lot of coal burning too, an awful lot of coal burning out yeah. west. The, yeah. You see the coal trains every day coming through right. from Wyoming. Right. Are there any other questions for Nancy? So, well, let's <laughs> give her a We've got a number of materials on the table, check them out, and there's hot water if you want coffee or tea in the back. So, thanks for coming. Thank you.